Welcome everyone to the 11th symposium on Czech foreign policy and its second day. And the first panel today, which uh, will be specially dedicated to security and multilateralism. We have been witness of, uh, there has been uh, several developments, quite recent developments in the security matters which might be given as an example of, uh, of individualistic, self-interested behavior, uh, rather an opposite of multilateralism, uh, annexation of Crimea is one example, or um, Brexit, another example, but in many cases these recent developments were met by a multilateral response. In case of uh, annexation of Crimea, NATO responded uh, with the, the enhanced forward presence, EFP, in the Baltic states and Poland. With respect to Brexit, uh, the EU responded with uh, uh, renewed emphasis on defense cooperation. One example of that is PESCO. Uh, there might be other illustrations of self-interested um, individualistic behavior uh, take uh, the, the end of the INF treaty uh, take the recent China's behavior of China now the question is whether there is a possibility for multilateral response to that or not and maybe more importantly whether we would have to redefine multilateralism as such. Usually, under the concept of multilateral approach, all of us, or most of us, understand kind of a, a policy, a preferred policy of a disadvantaged actor, a small state, an organization uh, with uh, only soft power, without the hard power, uh, and so on and so on. But there has been some periods in history when uh, great powers engaged in multilateral cooperation. Whether it was the Vienna Congress or other periods after great wars, uh, I may leave up to you, but are we currently living in such a period again when there is a, a need for multilateral cooperation of great powers themselves, not the small states, but the multilateral cooperation of great powers. And therefore, the topic of our panel, security, multilateralization, multilateralism in combination with the new challenges in security environment. And we have a great panel today with the uh, uh, amazing combination of uh, panelists, so please let me introduce them. Uh, uh, I will first start with uh, Magda Ekboska, the Vice President of the uh, Respublika Foundation uh, based in uh, Warsaw and also Director of Operation of the Visegrad Insight, uh, a platform for discussion on uh, Central European issues. Uh, she has been working uh, previously at the Polish Institute of International Affairs and she's main focus is uh, the involvement of women in uh, security matters. On my left we have uh, Ambassador John Cloud. He's professor at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, but previously served as the U.S. Ambassador to Lithuania and had a uh, has an amazing, uh, really great experience uh, uh, from the U.S. Foreign Service, 30 plus years. Uh, with uh, he held positions in different European countries in Warsaw, in Brussels, in Berlin, in Bonn, and so on and so on. And Lithuania as an ambassador as well. On my uh, further right, we have uh, Werner. Haslaben, president of the uh, Austrian uh, Institute for European and Security Policy. Uh, he has been the longest serving Austrian defense minister, 
who oversaw the adaptation and modernization of Austrian defense forces after the end of the Cold War. He's also, he, was, he was also uh, an, a member of parliament for some 20 years, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, well, with respect to our topic, you, so you organized the first meeting of the European defense ministers. So that's quite a multilateral background, to say the least. And on the extreme right uh, is, uh, <laughs> is uh, literally, not metaphorically, is uh, Jan Wierisch, who is uh, head of uh, defense councils uh, of the, at the Czech permanent delegation to NATO, who is based in, uh, in Brussels. He has an extensive experience from uh, Czech MOD, including serving as uh, director of defense policy, but he's also a unique combination of a practitioner and scholar, because he uh, lectured for many years at the Charles University in Prague. Uh, without further delay, I would uh, like to start our uh, panel. We will speak uh, our panelists will speak in an alphabetic order. We will start with Ambassador John Cloud, then the President uh, Werner Faslabend, then uh, uh, Vice President uh, uh, Ms. Magda Jakubowska, and at the end we will have a practitioner, uh, Mr. Jan Jiresz. Matush, thank you very much. Uh, as I did yesterday, I must begin by uh, clarifying that the views I express today will be my own views and not those of the Naval War College or the U.S. Navy. Uh, I also will apologize in advance to those who were here late yesterday afternoon. You're going to hear some similar themes of what I present today. We have named the period since 1991 as the post-Cold War period, and that, but there seems to be a general consensus that this period has either come to an end or is coming to an end. During this period, the United States played a unique role in the world. Some have described this as the U.S.'s unipolar moment. The period has seen both great benefits and considerable problems, and I fully understand that some may focus on the benefits while others focus on the problems. The period, though, is also marked by some decline in the importance of sovereignty and the rise of non-state actors. Nevertheless, from a multilateral perspective, the key institutions have survived, although some of them are under stress today. The United Nations still maintains its preeminent position, as we will see with the opening of the General Assembly uh, this week. But I would argue that the ability of the Security Council to play the, play the role the organization's founders intended is open to question. And this is uh, because of whether it will be able to get things done moving forward. Actions in Libya brought this issue to the fore in 2011. And those who have heard me yesterday may wonder why i obsessed with Libya. Uh, it's a unique case where we had the Arab League invite action. We had the Security Council approve action. We had fairly decisive action but we did not have the outcome that we had hoped for. So that's why I use it as a, a, a useful example. At that time, as I said, after calls for a no-fly zone by the Arab League, the Council approved action uh, to protect civilians in Libya. However, in the wake of the killing of Gaddafi, a leader that nobody loved and supported, which was, may have made this a unique case, there was disagreement on the UN Security Council that leads me to doubt whether the Council will approve similar actions anytime soon. This may well prove to be unfortunate, and some would argue we've already seen that with the situation that then developed in Syria. The disagreement on the UN Security Council highlighted differences on the importance of sovereignty among the permanent members. In 2005, the UN had decided unanimously to endorse the concept of responsibility to protect but a limited responsibility to protect that had to be authorized each time by the Security Council. However, Russia and China, who had abstained on the original Libya authorization of all necessary measures, believe the actions taken, in this case by NATO, exceeded the UN Security Council authorization. Because of that, I anticipate that Russia and China 
will limit such UN Security Council authorizations in the future. Other key multilateral institutions in Europe, NATO and the European Union, have, been, have seen significant expansion during this century of their membership. NATO now has 29 members and took in new members during four different tranches during the, uh, from 1999 onward and should be prepared to take in Northern Macedonia in the near future. Uh, just as an aside, I had the pleasure to be temporarily the senior U.S. diplomat in Poland on the day the Poles joined NATO. The European Union had its Big Bang expansion in 2004 that included the countries of many in this room today and has since taken in Bulgaria, Romania, and Croatia. Nonetheless, we must acknowledge that both institutions have had challenges. NATO went out of area in Afghanistan, but its actions there were not as successful as we had hoped, despite strong efforts by many of its members. NATO continues to deal with its burden-sharing debate, a debate that is not new and is not just being pressed by President Trump, but in fact, uh, Defense Secretary Robert Gates made quite an elegant plea for our European allies to understand the importance of more contributions on their part. President Obama did it as well, and now, of course, we've seen President Trump pushing it very vigorously. Three years after Robert Gates talked about uh, burden sharing, we saw that Europe was not as peaceful as we had thought when Russia invaded Crimea and eastern Ukraine. In the aftermath of that, the NATO heads reaffirmed this burden sharing um, uh, goals, and we have until 2024 to try to achieve them. I hesitate to say too much about the European Union. This is not because I underestimate its importance to the world, to Europe, or to the United States. However, I remember clearly when I served at our mission to the European Union that I was regularly reminded by Eurocrats that the United States was not a member and we would do well to be quiet in Brussels, or at least in downtown Brussels. Uh, however, in an academic setting, I hope I can make a few statements on this important institution, and I am particularly pleased to do so in Prague, as I also remember how important it was for the Visegrad and others to build their relations with Brussels and aspire to become members going back now for 30 years. I think we can all agree that these have been trying years for the EU. When I arrived in Brussels in 1999, the Santo Commission had just resigned. That low point for the Commission is normally forgotten today because of other events. And when you look at the Greek financial crisis that spread into a more general Euro crisis, that moved to the migration issues resulting from the Syrian civil war, and then moved on to Brexit, you can see these have been trying times for Brussels institutions, for the member states of the EU, but also for the friends of the EU throughout the world. We can only hope that Brexit will be quickly resolved, and note I'm not going to comment on a preferred resolution. This is a decision for Europe, for, for the United Kingdom and for Europe. Uh, I don't believe as an American that my views matter on the issue and that the new EU leadership will be successful as they move forward. At the same time, on the security side, we face new and revised challenges. China is a force to be reckoned with militarily and economically. Russia has come back militarily. And new security domains such as cyber present us with a whole new series of challenges. In addition, in the wake of the US withdrawal from the INF Treaty, something that Matush mentioned a few moments ago, we have a new set of challenges there. I would argue, though, it's important to see the U.S. withdrawal in the appropriate light, given continued Russian violations and the fact that China was not bound by the agreement, it was no longer working. It no longer had value. The INF had lost its effectiveness when Russia decided to violate it and when China rejected offers to join. There are other approaches that might work. One of my colleagues has called for a U.S.-Russia deployment ban, stretching from the Atlantic to the Urals. But I must be honest, this has picked up no support in Russia and China or in the United States. 
As we look at multilateralism, there's been an, an interesting debate going on about G question mark. What type of um, groupings we should have of these informal groupings? And this speaks to how the great powers look to work together and with other powers. There is, of course, a fiction that the G8, G7, or a future G2 will have either run the world or will run the world. Having staffed G8 meetings 20 years ago, I never saw those meetings as an effort to run the world, but more as an opportunity for like-minded leaders to compare notes on the issues that were confronting them at that time. In the same way, I seriously doubt that any future G2, G3, whatever, will do more than uh, that note comparing exercise. At the same time, we need to recognize that how multilateral institutions respond to the rise of China, the resurgence of Russia, and the introduction of new weapons will determine how those institutions flourish. Uh, the, the 2017 United States National Security Strategy foreshadowed that we are entering into an, a world of renewed great power competition. And I would argue that the, future mul the, the fate of the future multilateral system will be determined by how it adapts to this new reality. So when we look at the questions for this session, we see two e essential elements. How are great powers willing to work with others, or would they prefer to go it alone? And two, is multilateralism a tool for smaller powers to have a greater voice? I clearly cannot give you a definitive American position. I would argue my country is split. President Trump, at least on trade issues, has stated clearly that he appear, prefers to approach these issues on a bilateral basis. However, on security issues, he has supported NATO and Article 5. At the same time, former Defense Secretary Mattis, in his 20 December 2018 resignation letter, said, quote, one core belief that I have always held is that our strength as a nation is inextricably linked to the strength of our unique and comprehensive system of alliance and partnerships, unquote. In fact, we are not, uh, and, uh, so, so Matt has clearly laid out that our working with other players, our working with our allies uh, in a multilateral environment is something that has built strength for the United States. As I mentioned um, yes, yesterday, I think in many ways the United States is not so much multilateral or bilateral as pragmatic. We're looking to where we can have effect and we'll use whatever it is that will bring us the most effect. Americans, unlike Europeans, and again this is a repeat of what I said yesterday, look at multilateralism as a tool, not necessarily as an outcome. Thus, I find it hard to give answers to the questions that Matush posed uh, to this panel. The move to three major powers will confront the world with new challenges. How the powers adapt to this structure will be important, but how the other players adjust may well be just as important. So thank you for listening to me today. I look forward to your questions after my colleagues have spoken. Thank you, Ambassador John Clare, and now I will hand over the floor to President Franz Labent. Yeah, first of all, I want to say uh, I will present only my very personal view. Nothing of it uh, is uh, in common with uh, any political direction from the Austrian government. And I think when we are talking about uh, multilateralism, of course this is a very important question because uh, it touches the question, what will be the future world order? Which place will Europe have within this order? Uh, will we have a rule-based system? What will it be? And at the moment, of course, uh, it does not look so favorable for multilateralism. When uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, made her presentation uh, in front of the European Parliament, she gave a very clear statement 
for multilateralism. She spoke about uh, the challenges we are confronted with, demographic change, globalization uh, of the world economy, digitalization, working environment, climate change, and so on. And she said, well, uh, none of these challenges will go away. But there have been different ways to react to these threats. Some are turn turning towards authoritarian regimes. Some are buying their global influence and creating dependencies by investing in ports and roads. And others are turning towards protectionism. We want multilateralism. We want fair trade and so on. We have to do this European way. And if you try to analyze it, you will uh, find out very quickly that this, from the European perspective, certainly will be uh, a need in order to secure our place uh, in the future world. But let's, before, maybe try to analyze a little bit reality. Reality has shown us in the past, uh, it has shown in history, that big powers act like big powers. They follow their interest, and the smaller ones have to follow these guidelines. This is more or less uh, an experience we do have, and this will not change very quickly. Just let me look at uh, real situations we are confronted with. We have already talked about Russia, Crimea. It's not only Crimea. In 2008, they overtook Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and almost nobody protested. Just a little bit, formal protest but nobody cared. The consequence was that they overtook also Crimea because they had a very strong strategic interest. And what followed uh, a few years later was the Donbass uh, with Donetsk uh, and Luhansk. So far, uh, it seems to be clear. When this great power has a very clear interest, they will try to follow it. Not every time uh, this is very successful, because overtaking uh, not only Crimea, but also more or less by friendly troops occupying Donetsk and Luhansk, brought a situation that uh, in heart, by heart, the Ukrainian people separated from Russia. If you look back, you know, there were so many links, strong links be between those uh, very much related nations. And the occupation of Crimea, of Donetsk and Luhansk brought a new consciousness, a new national consciousness uh, for Ukraine. Okay, you, so you can say this is Putin and this is old uh, Soviet style or whatever. Uh, how is this situation at the other side? Let us look, is the United States really the bright, shining light uh, at the horizon? Uh, many times it looks that way, but not every time. Just let us take the question of the nuclear deal with Iran. Six world powers. Are the permanent members of Security Council plus Germany negotiate more than two years with Iran? They find a deal. They find an instrument to control it. And then suddenly, somebody not only quits the deal, but he forces all the others, his friends in Europe, but also the Russians and the Chinese, to follow the sanctions. He is imposing. Let's just imagine what role can diplomacy play in the future, what means consensus, if in such a situation where the most important powers of the world sit together, find a consensus, make a decision, shape the instruments 
uh, to control it, and then somebody just kicks it away like nothing. Almost the end of diplomacy. Everybody will ha have to ask himself whether he goes into such negotiations and whether he will accept rules uh, that are made uh, in a multilateral way. Okay, let's go further. China, Belt and Road. Just let me take the question of South China Sea. What does it mean? China claims almost 90% of, of the waters of South uh, China Sea as more or less their territorial waters. And of course, this is of quite some strategic importance for the country. China used to be a terrestrial power in the last few thousand years. And it has to become now to, due to its uh, importance as an export and import nation, of course, also a sea power because 90% of world trade go by sea. Okay, I can understand it. But does it really mean that they can just kick away every claim of others? That they do not accept international rules by international court? What are we doing? Is it just a question between China and uh, the Philippines and Vietnam? No. Of course the question of free navigation will be over there. And of course if we just look to the map, all the, uh, the cyber cables between East Asia and South Asia, between Europe and East Asia and partly America, go through South China Sea. And the one who will control South China Sea will control all the information processes. And therefore, of course, there is a multilateral interest and China is acting against it. So it's always easy to talk about the others. They are the bad guys and we are, of course, the good ones. Let's look at Libya. Why are we in such a mess in Libya? If we are honest, we have more or less to profess that it was the different interests between two European powers, between France and Italy. On the oil sector in Libya, that brought us into this situation. This was not American politics. This was purely the interest between two European powers, both of them members of EU and both of them also uh, members of NATO. And if you look further, okay, what happened just the other day between India and Pakistan? Did India care about uh, the international community, or uh, did India try to find a multilateral way uh, to solve the question or to contribute positively uh, to the question? I would say rather no. Let's look to Iran or to Turkey or to Israel, and you will find similar examples. So far, the lesson is Multilateralism is in a very weak situation at the moment, very weak. And the main reason behind it is, it is that we have, of course, a tremendous shift of power all over the world. And in such a situation, uh, everybody will look at his own interests and not look at multilateral uh, organizations or instruments in order to bring solutions. So far, is it needless, does it make sense uh, to work for multilateral items? I would say even if an overview as I have done it now, very frankly and very bluntly, without Go, uh, going into details and of course you can discuss about any case but I think in s some situations you have to speak out things very clearly in order to be aware and not just to produce papers and uh, nice phrases and sentences okay 
Yes, we have. We have a need for multilateral uh, re regulations. And we also have a chance, not in every respect. Where do, we, where do we have chances? Where don't we have chances? And I would formulate it this way. Everywhere, in every field where there is a real common global interest, there will be a good chance for multilateralism. This could be climate change. This could be, I don't know, cybersecurity somehow in some aspects, not the whole complex. This could be also the fight against uh, organized crime and fight against terrorism, although this is already very different because the classification of what is terrorism, uh, of course, uh, is very different. We will hardly find solutions on the armament sector. Why? Because, of course, when you have a situation of such shifting powers, uh, everybody will look at his own strategic situation and will try to compensate it with uh, some instruments, compensate the strength of the other side. And this is the reason why we will not have uh, good regulations of uh, missile uh, deals or nuclear deals in the future. We have to get away of this. Why? Of course, I mean, uh, in the past, we had a very clear uh, situation. The United States were not only the the clear number one, it was the number one politically, economically, culturally, uh, and militarily. All over the world. They set the tendencies. Now we have declining power from the US and we have uh, increasing power from the Chinese side. And of course they try also on the uh, military side to compensate uh, or at least partly compensate the American strength. So far, what are they doing? They are not part of uh, the missile deal, short range missiles. They have quite some interest in order, uh, well, to get some military strength and uh, maybe uh, to kick out also the American domination uh, that more or less is projected by carrier, uh, by fighter carriers all over the world. And therefore, they will invest quite a lot. And as long as uh, China keeps aside, it also would, would make sense not for the Russians and not for the Americans to stay in such a treaty. And therefore, there will be none. You can be sure. What the carrier is on the one side for the Americans are uh, hypersonic weapons, space missiles uh, for the Eastern world, for the Russians, and for the Chinese. And therefore, they invest a lot. They have already very high standards. And of course, they will not go into any agreement before they do not reach uh, more or less a strategic balance between the big powers. This is the reality. And in so far, I would say uh, we should try not just to talk uh, with uh, all the ideals that uh, we have learned in our youth and also afterwards, but try to be consequent and try to find ways uh, to act in fields uh, that can, can provide opportunities for it. For us. It's not the armament sector, but for sure uh, the climate change sector is one. There's already Europe, there is already China, there is parts of America inside, there is India within the game, because everybody feels it. I mean, if you look to the situation that, I, that, I don't know, Delhi has the biggest problems 
uh, in uh, environmental question. It's not Western developed countries, but the developing countries that have the biggest problems. This certainly is something uh, we have to work on. And we can do that similar also in the question of organized crime. This will be necessary. Necessary because, of course, you know, uh, organized crimes became more and more powerful. And if you look also to the links uh, with terrorism, you can see this is a need for everybody. Because organizations, uh, non-state organizations, have gained so much power and will gain so much power in the future that it is necessary to act commonly. That's what I see. Uh, and there are already all, also some models. John Mersheimer uh, more or less uh, presented already a model for future, for future uh, possible multilateral system. He, he thinks it could be a three-zone multilateral model. An American zone, a Chinese zone, and the global zone. Maybe it will come out, maybe it will work out, but it only will work out uh, and it only will work if all of us try very hard to go for it, to stand for it, to fight for it. And when I say in all of those questions I have mentioned, whether this is Crimea or the Donbass, whether this is the nuclear deal with Iran, whether this is the South China Sea and the fight for free navigation, whether this is all the other smaller problems, there is still space and frame to act. And what is necessary to use the possibilities that are within, it's wrong, I think it's wrong, you know, just to concentrate whether we manage it uh, by 100%. One of my favorite sayings is between zero and 100%, there are 99 possibilities, and it makes quite a difference whether you land at 20 or at 80 in reaching your goals. And therefore, uh, I'm very critical, but still I'm positive. Thank you very much, President. And our next speaker will be Ms. Vice President Magda Jakubowska. Thank you, Matus. Uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen. Um, I will follow this um, your speech with being more uh, more positive. Um, I believe that uh, NATO is adapting to new reality. Um, having this crisis of multilateralism, as this is this popular wisdom that is said. Um, NATO is one of the uh, strongest organizations around the world that is, of course, challenged at the moment, but um, NATO is not only its arsenal. It's not about nuclear or classic weapon uh, that it has, but it has the ability to reform and to adapt to our rules-based order. Um, of course, it is under pressure, but NATO stays flexible um, while preserving core uh, raison d'etre and values uh, that it's conformed to. Um, NATO to me, also with the, the, the test of time. Um, of course, uh, I will focus more on the recent times. In, um, in 2010, uh, it drew uh, new tasks for the Alliance for the first 21st century and in, in the strategic concept. It focused on collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security. Um, working with an, also non-NATO uh, countries. Um, huge test in 2014 for NATO's relevance was Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea, or still is, rather. 
Um, this, <clears throat> I think Russia, to some extent, created a uh, new security environment. It became quite assertive. It started large military actions. It became aggressive in nuclear rhetoric. Um, it started some exercises along NATO borders, hybrid attacks, and uh, it interferes uh, democratic processes in many of the NATO countries. Um, Russia has also breached the INF Treaty, or it breached the Chemical Weapon Convention. Um, so it tests NATO on an everyday basis, I would say. In 2014, another test, uh, the birth of the caliphate in Iraq, um, ongoing uh, crisis in, in Syria, the conflict where Russia and Turkey inf interfere. Um, again, NATO faced uh, or faces a new uh, challenge. Um, I think that uh, NATO managed to, to make important steps to, to adjust to that situation, to adjust to the, those almost everyday uh, crises that uh, are there in, uh, uh, in the world. Uh, it, um, it has put uh, the dialogue with, the, with Russia on hold to some extent. It, uh, it, I mean, the cooperation was put on hold. Uh, it started uh, some dialogue, but it's not easy. But um, it, it still has the uh, military lines of communications or uh, it, it has the, this political dialogue that is NATO-Russia Council. Um, NATO invested in collective defense, uh, it, um, especially in Poland and in Baltic states. Uh, I think that uh, most important decisions, uh, uh, again, uh, the commitment in, in Wales summit uh, for the 2% GDP spending on, on defense uh, was very important sign that NATO is strong and NATO will go on um, investing into its strengths. Um, Apart from um, educational efforts and uh, additional personnel in, in, in NATO's building, new building, um, I think that uh, it is important that NATO invested into innovations, into following uh, the threats that are absolutely um, new and they are happening in a cyberspace. Um, NATO uh, stayed proactive uh, with uh, all the disruptive technologies um, in, in cyber, it, it has its cyber defense uh, policy. Uh, in Warsaw, it's, uh, at the summit, it admitted that the cyberspace is uh, new and, and the, well, leading domain of its operation. Um, it also uh, set up a cyber operations center. I believe that uh, NATO, with uh, what it does, is, uh, is still a very strong multilateral organization. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, um, the multilateral world can only work out if we all stand for it. So um, I thought of uh, adding the, the gender uh, uh, issue that uh, Matush has asked me to, to include. And I think that, um, as I mentioned, NATO is very strong in its, uh, in its uh, position. It also uh, is very strong in educating, in bringing people together. But there are still issues with women's engagement into NATO. 
uh, as we all know, women are 50% of the population or even more in some countries. Um, and uh, the security challenges that are nowadays happening are very, should be very important to women. But uh, many researchers and many um, analyses that the NATO does show that women um, are, are significantly not concerned, <coughs> sorry, uh, not concerned about key security challenges in the world. Um, women are stay away from different problems like, I don't know, terrorism, ISIS, uh, issues like North Korea, women are just not much interested. They, they find this, um, uh, this topic as, as just men's world and they just don't interfere into this, which is, um, which is of course a challenge to NATO. NATO is trying to respond to that. It, it, um, it brings some important uh, educational work um, so that uh, women were all in. Um, and I believe that uh, in such contexts, um, uh, it is important also to mention that women are a huge part of peace processes or should stay a huge, huge part of peace processes. And NATO is more and more putting uh, efforts to that with uh, even solo female peace um, missions like in Cyprus nowadays, or uh, one that is uh, done in, um, in Israel. Uh, so I believe that uh, being together and, and putting all efforts, including the efforts of women into that, is, is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Vice President. And the last speaker uh, on this panel will be Mr. Jan Iresh. Please, the floor is yours. Many thanks for the floor and good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure. pleasure. Uh, this conference uh, has some tradition and reputation already, so uh, I'm, I'm glad uh, that I have a chance uh, to be uh, a part of it. Uh, also, I would like to join my uh, colleagues on the panel to, uh, to re recite my disclaimer uh, at the beginning. Uh, uh, meaning that everything I will say um, is my personal opinion and uh, it is not an official position of the Czech Minister of Defense, uh, as you would expect, I guess. Um, well, based, based on how this panel is outlined, it seems to me that uh, uh, when it comes to security and international security management, uh, we can broadly talk about two types of uh, multilateralism. The first type is uh, universalist, inclusive, collective security organizations and regimes based at least theoretically, uh, on great power cooperation. Examples are obvious, uh, United Nations or various arms control and non-proliferation agreements and regimes. At the same time, such universalist multilateralism contains by definition elements of great power concert uh, with all the associated uh, connotations, both positive and negative. And some uh, could say that it is not only about benign great power cooperation, but also about great power condominium in control of smaller powers. And small powers such as Central European countries have, of course, uh, been always concerned about uh, any kind of great power concert. The other type of multilateralism is uh, regional groupings and alliances uh, organized and led by great powers. The logic usually, usually being that uh, the great power provides public goods to less powerful members, uh, typical, uh, typically security and protection, in exchange for uh, their loyalty and support in buttressing uh, uh, the, the great power status of the security provider. Um, so there is a bargain between clients uh, and their protector. A textbook example of, of, of this type is, of course, uh, NATO. Um, and the fact is that uh, the United States uh, 
has for a long time been the only existing global power in possession of, of a network of uh, multilateral organizations and alliances, uh, which uh, greatly adds to US power and global reach, uh, regardless uh, whether this is recognized by the current US leadership. Um, given my affiliation, I will uh, briefly focus uh, on NATO on top of what, uh, of what has already been said by uh, Magda in particular. Um, it has become a conventional wisdom to say that uh, the Czech historical experience shows that bilateral security relationships uh, such as those practiced uh, between the wars are bad, meaning uh, unreliable, weak, risky, dangerous, uh, whereas multilateralism represents an enlightened, an enlightened uh, remedy for failed bilateralism. This rings broadly true, of course, uh, even though one can play devil's advocate and argue that uh, uh, the Czech Republic's membership uh, in NATO has been less about multilateralism and more about a bilateral alliance with the United States uh, to balance regional powers in Europe, at least initially. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and I'll come back uh, to that later, uh, that uh, there are actually strong elements of bilateralism within NATO in general. Um, Today's revisionist powers, meaning uh, China and Russia, uh, seek to use the universalist multilateral, uh, multilateral organizations, when it's used them, of course, uh, to boost uh, their power and influence and impose constraints on the United States, naturally because they are members uh, of these organizations in the first place. Uh, in contrast, they actively seek undermining and subverting regional multilateral organizations of which they are not members and whom they consider as impeding uh, their cloud in dealing with uh, smaller powers. In their interactions with uh, small powers, uh, they naturally strive for bilateralism to exploit uh, their relative strength. And we have, of course, uh, uh, seen uh, multiple examples uh, uh, of, of, this, uh, of this approach uh, uh, from uh, Russia and China over the past couple of decades. Uh, uh, simply from their perspective, uh, the smaller powers membership in regional multilateral uh, security organizations uh, stands in the way. Um, NATO, in my opinion, is a truly unique institution. Uh, it is a hybrid institution. Um, first, it is both alliance and organization. And as I have already hinted, uh, uh, rather than being one alliance, it is a collection of U.S. alliances with European countries, meaning that NATO is actually both bilateral and multilateral. Uh, another distinctive feature of NATO, which again makes it a, a sort of hybrid type of institution, is that it deals both with uh, collective defense and collective security. Uh, and has uh, done so uh, since uh, it was established uh, 70 years ago. At the same time, uh, at the same time NATO uh, also has got some truly unique features that are quintessentially multilateral, and no other organization or institution around the world uh, uh, has ever uh, possessed uh, such, uh, uh, such features. Uh, uh, first, uh, it is the standing multinational command structure meaning those uh, thousands and thousands of officers coming from all NATO members that actually uh, sit and work 24-7 uh, 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 in uh, NATO, in, in, in different uh, NATO uh, commands uh, uh, around the alliance. The second uh, very important multilateral, multilateral feature uh, uh, in NATO is the NATO defense planning process. Again, this is a unique feature. Uh, no other organization uh, has ever possessed. And uh, um, uh, as a sort of a footnote, I would add a third uh, uh, element or the third, uh, the, the thir uh, a third feature, which is more, which more uh, um, is, uh, important when it comes to the internal culture of, uh, of the organization, but I would argue that it still is important. And the fact uh, that uh, uh, all national delegations, uh, national delegations of all NATO members are physically located in one building uh, at, at the NATO headquarters in, in Brussels uh, alongside the organization's uh, apparatus. Uh, again, this is a truly unique feature probably no other organization uh, has. Um, this, I would argue, makes 
uh, NATO rather effective and efficient as a, a multilateral institution. Uh, despite being, an, of course, an intergovernmental organization whose decision-making is based on consensus, uh, there is a very strong peer pressure uh, within NATO, or not so much peer if you think about it, of course. Um, um, and uh, this phenomenon seems to be much stronger than in the, United, uh, in the European Union. Uh, there are no early morning summit decisions uh, uh, made in NATO. Uh, everything is uh, duly pre-negotiated. Pre uh, of course, this uh, uh, is very much due to the different internal uh, cultures uh, within each organization, but uh, uh, I would argue that um, efficient uh, peer pressure uh, is uh, something that greatly contributes uh, uh, to this uh, uh, efficiency of NATO, and of course, uh, uh, by peer pressure, uh, I mean wink, wink, uh, the U.S. leadership mainly. Um, a related uh, thing uh, which we can very cre clearly see in how NATO operates uh, is uh, the old good uh, two-level governance. Uh, uh, social scientists in, in, in this room uh, uh, surely know what I am uh, uh, speaking about. Essentially, uh, uh, to, to, to use the, the textbook definition is, uh, uh, and, and, and to make it a bit, uh, uh, a bit, a bit spicy, it means uh, that uh, the mid-level bureaucracies conspire uh, with uh, uh, the organization, uh, the international organization, to, put, to, to exert pressure uh, on a national government uh, from both uh, uh, below and above. Uh, uh, and I, as I said, this is a textbook definition. I don't necessarily uh, confirm that this is the case in NATO. Uh, but anyway, uh, the two-level governance uh, uh, works in NATO, at least uh, to some extent. Uh, and uh, this is, as, as you can imagine, very much appreciated by us uh, in the deep state. Uh, so does NATO's current state of play and prospects uh, attest to a crisis of multilateralism? Uh, or does NATO suggest, uh, suggest that uh, regional multilateral, uh, multilateralism works? Uh, uh, despite all the hiccups we have seen over the past couple of years, I'm convinced uh, uh, the latter uh, is, is true, uh, uh, that, that NATO as a multilateral institution has, been, uh, has proven to be, to be pretty efficient. Uh, it is true that there are some worrying tendencies, uh, uh, to give an example. Um, using multilateral platforms uh, such as NATO to increase pressure on opponents in bilateral disputes. Traditionally, this has been, when it comes to Europe, uh, this has been the case with uh, Turkey and Greece, of course, but now we have seen it when it comes to uh, Turkey and Austria, for example, uh, or Hungary and, and Ukraine, of course, with Austria and Ukraine being uh, at the receiving end uh, of this practice. Um, potentially, uh, this, 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 this approach uh, uh, could be used uh, in a bilateral relationship uh, between the United States and Germany, meaning uh, using defense cooperation as leverage in trade disputes. And of course, it would have a, a very damaging impact uh, um, uh, on NATO if this, uh, if this uh, continues uh, uh, and, and, and multiplies. Uh, but overall, NATO as a uh, multilateral regional institution uh, has been a success, I would argue, over the past couple of years. It is much stronger today uh, than it was uh, in um, uh, 2013. Uh, I won't go into detail because you all know them, all those new instruments and, uh, and mm -hmm. tools of uh, collective uh, deterrence and defense uh, that have been established since uh, uh, 2014, such as uh, uh, the enhanced forward presence deployed in the Baltic countries and, uh, uh, and Poland, uh, uh, the, the, the much uh, uh, enhanced uh, uh, NATO response force, uh, uh, the NATO readiness initiative, which is uh, being implemented as we speak, and uh, uh, whose purpose is to increase the culture of military readiness uh, uh, around, uh, around NATO. Uh, we have done a lot in NATO when it comes to uh, making our strategy of quick reinforcement uh, of uh, uh, endangered allies in times of crisis and conflict uh, possible. Uh, this is what, uh, what is called in NATO jargon as the enablement of secure area of responsibility. And it's all about uh, military transportation, infrastructure, uh, host nation support, and, and things like that, that were obviously, and for, uh, I, 
for, for obvious reasons, uh, uh, very much neglected b b before 2014, uh, but, but, uh, but, but, but um, uh, have been uh, very much uh, uh, improved uh, since. Uh, uh, so this is what we all know, and again, I would say that now uh, NATO is much uh, stronger than it was uh, six years ago. Um, uh, you might argue that th there are uh, elements of bilateralism creeping in uh, which sort of undermine uh, the multilateral, multilateral uh, character of NATO and its efficiency. Uh, as I said, uh, my, my, my response would be that it has always, always been the case uh, in NATO since uh, 1949. Uh, uh, the US uh, military uh, bases around Europe uh, uh, have mostly been based on bilateral agreements between the United States and European countries. So, so, again, this is what I said at the beginning. Uh, NATO is a hybrid organization combining both uh, uh, features of uh, multi multilateralism and, uh, and bilateralism. So, no surprise here. And I wouldn't say that actually this, uh, uh, if, if, done, if done well, of course, uh, in, in an appropriate way, that th these elements of bilateralism would, un would be undermining uh, um, uh, NATO as a multi multilateral um, uh, organization. And my f uh, two, uh, final two remarks, uh, um, uh, uh, there are two things we should not forget about uh, NATO's import importance and role in uh, the management of uh, uh, European or uh, North Atlantic or, Nor or Euro-Atlantic security. Um, first, uh, um, uh, it is the continued relevance of NATO as a uh, transformational tool when it comes to domestic institutions, uh, uh, defense sectors, but not only that, of course. Uh, uh, NATO's impact as a transformational tool has, been, uh, has always been uh, much broader, especially when it comes to the exceeding, uh, exceeding countries, uh, uh, when it comes to the new, new members uh, uh, from Central and Eastern Europe. And, and, the, and this uh, uh, impact of NATO as a transformational tool um, uh, has been, of course, possible mostly thanks to those uh, multilateral instruments I have mentioned, uh, uh, in particular uh, the NATO command structure and uh, the NATO defense planning process. And my second and final point would be that uh, uh, NATO has always been also about m internal relationship management, to put it like that. Uh, uh, and and this is, this is uh, very often uh, you know, neglected uh, when discussing NATO purpose and uh, how it works. Uh, because, of course, uh, when, uh, you know, talking between allies, this can be tricky. Uh, uh, talking about uh, NATO's role as, uh, as, uh, as a tool of uh, um, managing relations among allies. But, uh, I mean, it's obvious that this, this role of NATO has, 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 has always been extremely important and will remain important uh, 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 in, in the future as well. Um, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yersh, for your comments, and thank you all the panelists for your remarks as well. I will not hijack the discussion. There has been lots of food for thought, and I believe the are questions in the audience, so I will open the Q&A session immediately and offer the opportunity to you, members of the audience, to ask the questions. Please raise your hands. <clears throat> Jakub Matso, Diplomatic Academy, Bratislava. I would like to thank you all for your contributions. My question is related to the role of the U.S. in the current security architecture. As we know, the U.S. has been instrumental in all security configurations since the Second World War, and it, there has been a talk about American exceptionalism. To what extent does, is America still exceptional? Thank you. And what can it do for the configuration of the future security architecture? Thank you. Okay, so please uh, let others go first. Uh, Mr. President, Vice President. Certainly, the U.S. still is exceptional. Due to its uh, overall capabilities it does have in politics, in economy, and militarily. Uh, and uh, we also have to be aware, it's uh, not only just the power question, 
but it is also the clear principles the United States are committed to uh, democracy, uh, market, economy, human rights. Uh, I mean, if you look to the history, uh, now sometimes it seems that the Europeans are in the forefront, uh, but more or less this is a consequence uh, of an education process that came from the States after World War II. And insofar, uh, one should not underestimate America's role. Uh, on the contrary, we will need the States, of course, uh, in the future. For every single uh, global question, you will need the United States to get solutions. And as I said, uh, of course nobody can predict what will bring the future, uh, whether uh, we will have a, a G2 uh, system or whatever. Uh, my personal opinion is, you know, that every system does have the tendency uh, to a clear hierarchy. And in the Western, at least in the Western world, uh, at the top of the hierarchy will be the United States. This is not only due to history, but also uh, due to the fact that it is by far the biggest uh, Western country with uh, 330, 340 uh, million people, and it is at the top of technological development and so on. Whether uh, we will have a bilateral system in the future, nobody can tell. Uh, but I think, you know, that the role of America certainly has become not less important, but if you want to concentrate on climate change, if you want to uh, fight against international crime, if you want to establish new systems uh, in the cyberspace and so on, you need America very, very much. Insofar, we all have learned that nobody is perfect. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, but, okay, we have to live with that. As I said, big powers act as big powers. And, of course, there is now also the danger that in this competition with China, uh, America will look more at its own interest and a little bit less at the interest uh, of others. But it always did. We also have to be aware that also NATO was not just uh, uh, an institution in order to protect the Europeans, but it also had a very clear function uh, of a countering strategy. For American security, it was very important, more or less, to control the Atlantic uh, uh, coast at the other side and the Pacific coast. In on the European side, it was made by NATO, and uh, at the Pacific side, it was made by this uh, uh, belt of alliances of uh, peninsulas uh, and, and islands like Japan, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines. Uh, insofar, it always had both sides, and it is necessary, because if there is no American interest, it will not uh, function the way uh, it should. Thank you. Mr. Yash. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, uh, I won't shock you when I say that uh, the U.S. leadership is absolutely essential for NATO. Actually, there are two countries uh, uh, which are essential for NATO, and uh, if uh, um, uh, either of them would uh, disengage uh, um, uh, from uh, NATO, NATO would cease to exist, and these two countries are the United States and Germany. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry uh, if there are any uh, UK uh, friends in this room. Uh, NATO could probably do without the UK, but not without Germany, uh, due to sheer uh, geography. Uh, so US leadership, uh, well, yeah, um, I think nobody disputes that. Uh, we have this issue of uh, burden sharing in NATO uh, over the past 70 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, more outspokenly over the past 25 years and uh, um, um, even more so over the past uh, three years. Uh, 
Uh, burden sharing, the agenda of burden sharing, which has been sort of uh, elevated by the current US administration to be the number one uh, 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 agenda item uh, in NATO, uh, should not, of course, be treated as the only important thing in NATO. Uh, but at the same time, we must acknowledge that simply uh, attaining uh, a, a fairer burden sharing uh, will be an in instrument uh, uh, to make NATO more equally multilateral when it comes to resources. It, it, it's simply as simple as that. Uh, as has been said by Ambassador Cloud, uh, this is not a new thing. Uh, um, uh, this really has been, uh, has been uh, emphasized by a number of US presidents and presidential administrations uh, uh, before. Uh, so uh, we might question the methods and the language used by President Trump uh, uh, when, when it comes to burden sharing, but uh, um, but uh, the, 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 it, it is it is clear that this is one of the one of the keys to uh, NATO's efficiency uh, uh, for the future. Uh, so uh, again, American leadership uh, not so peer pressure uh, uh, when it comes to uh, other allies. Uh, uh, defense spending has been crucial, and it has delivered. Actually, it started uh, already during uh, the Obama administration uh, after after the Wales summit of September 2014, and it was, it was ever more, uh, 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 ever more uh, emphasized by the Trump administration, but, but American leadership, even though it might sound nasty uh, at some point, uh, has been efficient in delivering on burden sharing, at least to some extent. Thank you. Thank you, and Ms. Jakubowska or Mr. Cloud? I will briefly just uh, just come back to your question, saying, you know, U.S. has always, well, is kind of uh, a father to the system of multilateral system. Of course, I would agree uh, to some extent that uh, U.S. Uh, NATO cannot exist without U.S. and Germany. We have more and more um, European um, powers put together uh, or having alliances, additional alliances um, in terms of security, like the uh, yesterday launched uh, multilateral alliance by the Germany and France. So we can see that there are some uh, movements towards being some kind of um, maybe outweighing uh, the strength of the U.S. But uh, this is one thing. Another thing is, of course, China being more and more um, trying to gain some leadership position in that. But uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, it is just impossible to outweigh U.S. Thank you. We heard European voices. Now let's heard American voice. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate um, the comments that have been made. I think it is a challenge the United States tries to give itself by some of these terminology that has been used, that we use ourselves at times, such as exceptional. Um, I think, as we've heard earlier, um, a self-critique would not be um, empty. There would be reasons t for us to self-critique how we have acted. At times, some of it just by looking at things in retrospect, some of it by um, different tactics used to try to accomplish a goal. Um, we very much see NATO as an essential multilateral effort. I appreciate that it has its bilateral elements to it, um, and, but an effort that is in all of our interests. And we are mindful of the fact that the only time Article 5 has been used was when the United States was attacked on September 11th. Um, it would be nice if that continues to be the history of the alliance. But, um, you know, we, as we move forward, hopefully um, uh, we will continue to find ways to work with our partners that are bene beneficial to all of us. Thank you. 
Thank you for your responses, and the floor is yours. The members of the audience, if there are any more questions, please do raise your hand. Lady at the back, please. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, yeah, first of all, I represent here, my name is Irina Krasnitska, I represent here in Prague the Secretariat of the OSCE. Uh, that is the organization which is also, to me, uh, uh, well, uh, quite important for the European security, especially, or, or again nowadays, I would say. But um, uh, I wanted just uh, uh, to ask Mrs. Jakubowska, uh, where, where are the polls saying that women are not interested in security? Uh, this would be very interesting for me because I'm afraid that uh, the, those who are the most in, interested in security are mothers. Uh, so, uh, and we have seen many movements of those. Maybe, uh, or, but maybe you touched upon the, the fact that, that there are too few women in uh, decision-making positions, uh, and uh, that's true. Uh, and uh, I must say that, for example, uh, the organization I represent here is really doing much uh, for women, peace, and security agenda, uh, and uh, of course, not only uh, from the side of the violence on, on women uh, during conflicts, but also trying to uh, get women more involved in solving of the conflicts. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Well, absolutely. Uh, much is done. It is not that women are absolutely left with nothing. Um, uh, I was uh, more reflecting to the general public, um, women as such. They are, of course, mothers, uh, but I believe, to me, uh, security is such a broad uh, concept that women should stay engaged on a very many level in the terms like uh, cybersecurity nowadays. There are not only issues that we all don't understand, uh, you know, that are quite secretful uh, actions of different uh, services, but there are also very uh, normal situations where uh, people, uh, bank accounts are attacked or uh, children uh, of those mothers are, uh, are attacked via the internet. So uh, I think uh, what I meant uh, was that more and more women should be engaged on, into security issues on a very everyday basis. Um, you asked about the, uh, the research. Um, there are not many numbers at all. We can only see how many women are there here in the audience. We can uh, count those uh, leadership positions. Uh, OCE is one of the uh, better institutions about it. Odir is headed by uh, a lady that is very strong uh, personality, and um, and I think she does a lot about uh, women's and women's agenda, women peace and security agenda. In, um, in this, uh, in her role. Uh, Nate also uh, does a lot, even um, many uh, grants or NGOs efforts are awarded uh, nowadays for the agenda. Uh, the Secretary General has its own uh, advisor for gender issues and for this women peace and security agenda there is a huge push on adapting the um, uh, uh, the resolution 1325 which is on women peace and security uh, among many uh, countries that haven't done much about it including uh, Visegrad countries in, uh, in Poland, we have already, so uh, all the countries have uh, signed the resolution, have adopted it, but uh, none of the uh, Central European countries have the national action plan that is 
devoted to really implementing this uh, resolution. In Poland, we have it since uh, last year, the end of the year. Uh, in Czechia, Slovakia, and Hungary, there is no move uh, in this uh, in this part. So, what I just wanted to to say is that women. As, as general public should be more involved into security issues and and men because uh, mostly these are men in this uh, in this field of, of expertise should more engage those women thank you and since we have last couple of minutes left I believe there is a, a space for very brief final remarks and an answer to a Final question on the gentleman on the front row, on the right. Good morning, everybody. Michael Lambert. I'm working for the Deutsche Post DHL at the moment in Prague. Um, I would like to come back on this question of NATO uh, in a certain way. I would not see it as a positive influence in Europe. Um, I would say in that sense that it might be one of the reasons why we are not having a European community of defense. So I would like maybe to have your opinion about it. Is it uh, somehow the fact of having NATO an issue for this emerging community of defense? Uh, my second aspect is that um, we're going a bit fast when it comes to China, always seeing it as an enemy. But China has shown many positive results when it comes to promoting multilateralism, anti-colonialism in Asia, or also, for example, space defense, uh, or cyber defense, even if in that case the US was the attacker. So um, I would say that maybe we should think about China as maybe a mediator and also a positive influence to solve some conflict that we have, especially with Russia at the moment, more than seeing it as a threat. Maybe you have some key or some aspect about it. Why do we always see China as a threat instead of actually an ally, especially considering the huge amount that they are investing in Europe uh, and the wish to promote multilateralism that is always mentioned by them? Thank you. These are very challenging questions. I believe we cannot answer them fully in one minute, but please let's... Ambassador, would you like to start? I think the phrase I used dealing with China was a competitor, not necessarily a threat. And um, clearly there are cases, uh, the South China Sea case was, uh, was expressed where China's actions have been problematic. The, but the reality is China is going to be a player and the question becomes how do we work with China effectively moving forward? Uh, so. You know, if we only see China as a negative, we will have created a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I would agree with you, we have this challenge uh, to adjust to a world that is changing, and the world has changed many times in the past. Mr. Vice President. To some extent, uh, yes. Uh, China should not be treated uh, w w with such a uh, bad word. But, um, to look at the measures that China is taking uh, in economy, that you mentioned investments in the EU, um, it is hard to stay very positive on, on the uh, interests that, that China may have. Also, the uh, actual uh, very strong or growing relationship that China has with Russia uh, could be treated as a threat to the typical Western um, world. Thank you. Mr. President. Yeah, you asked two questions. The one is uh, EU-NATO uh, relations. I guess we are working on it. We are uh, on the right way. It uh, will take us years and decades uh, to, to accomplish this work. Uh, the China question is for me, of course, First of all, a big challenge. Every other global actor, whether this is America or uh, Russia or European Union or India, will define itself more or less on China's rise in the coming years. And insofar, this will uh, occupy us quite a bit. Uh, you have to differ between uh, contents and procedures, of course, uh, sometimes it's the contents and sometimes it is the procedures. China is very pushy, uh, 
various, uh, especially European Union, needs quite some time, but it's also other questions. I usually ask uh, uh, Chinese diplomats or the politicians, what would you say, I mean, talking about 16 plus 1 in Europe, what would you say if European Union would establish uh, a circle of, uh, so including Kazakhstan, Mongolia, Inner Mongolia, uh, uh, Xinjiang, and Tibet? What would Beijing say? How would it react? On the other hand, it is for them very clear that uh, they can establish something that is uh, not even against the uh, EU interest in Brussels, but at least aside it. And insofar, it's also a question of reciprocity. Uh, both sides will have to learn. Thank you. And the last word will rightfully go to the Czech Defense Councilor. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, just a few words uh, regarding this. Uh, uh, relationship between uh, NATO and the EU's uh, uh, defense and security dimension. I think this is really a false dichotomy. Uh, and uh, um, uh, it should be, uh, it should not, it, it was this sort of ideologically driven artificial dichotomy was, uh, uh, was alive back in 1990s. It's gone now, don't revive it, okay? We have always uh, uh, believed that, I, and I, I guess, most people in this room that there is something called the European or Euro-Atlantic uh, uh, security architecture comprising uh, of a network of uh, uh, different institutions uh, uh, all sort of contributing to uh, to uh, security and stability and defense including NATO, the EU, uh, OSCE, uh, the Council of Europe and other uh, organizations. So, uh, so this is really a dichotomy uh, that is not uh, valid any longer in my opinion. Uh, it was back in the 1990s when uh, some European like the French Foreign Minister Hubert Vagrin uh, dreamt about Europe uh, becoming a global military power to balance uh, the rogue United States. Um, uh, nobody uh, in Europe uh, uh, says, says that now for good reasons because uh, he or she would be taken to a mental as asylum immediately. Um, uh, in reaction back in 1990s the Americans reacted hysterically uh, uh, we are past that. Now both European and Americans uh, uh, agree with each other that actually um, developing uh, the EU defense and security dimension uh, is beneficial if done well and in appropriate way is beneficial for uh, transatlantic security and uh, uh, that developing uh, uh, European military capab cap capabilities regardless if within NATO or within the EU is beneficial uh, uh, to, uh, to, to boost uh, uh, European security and defense. So, um, so our American allies know that uh, what we do within the European Union uh, uh, is, uh, is, is boosting the European uh, pillar of NATO, uh, so they support it. Thank you. At the very end, let me thank to all four of our distinguished panelists for their contribution, and let me thank you all the members of the audience for coming here in the morning for the uh, first panel of the 11th symposium on Czech foreign policy and the second day of it. And please join me in applause for, for our panelists and the whole panel. Thank you, our moderator.